Hi, everyone. You know, I've got Fluffy and I've got Chocolate tonight, and they both seem to want to do this. They uh, have been hanging around. And I think that we are getting so close to that period of time where in the United States we have Thanksgiving that will be coming up and other nations have their Thanksgivings. And then there will be Christmas and that in the holidays at a time when it feels that there are so many geopolitical issues and everything feels sort of chopped up and chaotic, that I wish for all of you out there and around the world, in whatever your country, that you can pick up your dearest soul pet, your cat, your dog, a little mouse, whatever it is, and look at it as a life form on earth that has a soul like the rest of us, and that the essence of life on this planet may be to learn how we find the souls in each other and in our dear, dear soul pets and animals, and that that is what ties us to the divine field that is responsible for everything. And I hope that all of you, at some point in these days going forward in whatever holidays you celebrate, that you will be able to look at the light from the sun and look at your family and your beloved pets and think that, that love, the agape love that we should all feel for each other, that is what we need to work toward. And now I'm going to put my dear souls, who have been so wonderful, I'm going to put them down. Yeah, baby. And... Everyone, I have some good news to report. We made it to 125,000 subscribers this week. And I thank you, everyone, everywhere so much. Let's go for 250,000. Tell everyone you know to subscribe to my Earth Files YouTube live streams on Wednesday nights. And let's celebrate being able to join together here every week with your questions and personal experiences about high strangeness that kind of bond us. And let's try to get to a quarter million before that worldwide headline I've been impatiently waiting for that would make this an honest planet. We're not alone in this universe. And I've got a cold bottle of champagne in my refrigerator to celebrate with all of you on a special live stream. I don't care what the time is whenever that headline finally breaks. And at Earth Files, my goal is to keep bringing to you important news that our fellow human beings are experiencing on our planet with other intelligences and what those other intelligences are doing with the power brokers of Earth. And you know, my November 6th broadcast last week in which I reported about the loud jet-like noises being heard in clear skies by some people around the world, it has provoked so many more reports, including a September 14, 2011 video from Glens Falls, New York. That's eight years ago when all the booms and metal scrapings and trumpet sounds and strange roaring jet sounds first began in my files. The man is Derek Jabba, and he managed to videotape on his cell phone a couple of minutes of very loud jet sounds, and they seem they're right above him without any aircraft visible in the sky. So here is an excerpt from that 2011 recording that sure seems to match what people are again reporting this fall of 2019. Well, that was September uh, 14th of 2011. And now listen to some of the new email reports just since the 1st of November 2019, and today is the 13th, starting with strange jet sounds the first week of November. And I'm going to start with one coming from Slovenia, 
between Italy, Austria, and Croatia. Dear Linda, I'm just watching your YouTube video about strange jet sounds in the sky. I live in the capital of Slovenia in the center of the city. I heard these sounds on November 4th and 5th, 2019. I thought of a military plane, but it was just so loud and it sounded very low. The sound lasted for maybe 20 seconds and then went away and came back for a couple of minutes. And this happened several times in the middle of the day. It was cloudy, so I could not see anything, but I did think of all the strange sounds you were reporting over the years. It just did not sound normal. Yesterday, I'm talking to a friend on the phone. He lives a few kilometers away on the edge of the city, and he heard the same thing. He had exactly the same feeling, as if a huge jet is flying just above his house. This morning, I had goosebumps all over when I saw your video. I really wonder what's behind all of this. Thank you and best regards. Now we jump to Northern Ireland on November 5th. Hi, Linda. I'm from Northern Ireland, UK, and in the early hours of 5th November 2019, approximately between 2 and 4 a.m., I was awakened by a really loud jet-like noise. As far as I'm aware, planes do not fly at these altitudes in the UK after 11 p.m. at night. He means low. The jet-like noise was so loud it woke me from a deep sleep. I got up and went to look, expecting to see a plane coming toward my house or directly overhead, and there was nothing there. Many thanks for your work, Linda. Now, next, back to the United States and Cameron, Texas, also on November 5th. Hi, Linda. I am from a small town of 5,000 people in Cameron, Texas, about an hour south of Fort Hood. So we hear typical jets from time to time, but nothing like what happened November 5th. I've been listening to your YouTube show for several months, and it's my favorite thing to look forward to each week. Hey, thanks a lot. I truly can't thank you enough for sharing your knowledge with so many people. When I listened to your last show about strange jet sounds, I had no clue how many people are hearing the same thing. The day before your November 6th show, we were at work on November 5th. It was about 12.30 p.m. We heard a very loud jet noise, probably about 10 times the sound of a normal jet. It even felt like the building was vibrating and it scared the daylights out of me. I did go look outside and it was very cloudy. I couldn't see anything. So I just shrugged it off to probably a low flying jet until I was scrolling through Facebook. And so many people from our town were making posts about hearing the same thing. Thanks again. Now, Rhode Island. This was on uh, November 12th. This is Smithfield, Rhode Island. Linda, I stumbled onto your website after I started looking up strange sounds and after I heard jet engine noises early this morning, November 12th. So we're talking about yesterday. It woke me up and I ran to the window, but I could not see a thing. I could have sworn that a plane was about to crash right there. We never really hear planes overhead here, except when they are very high up. We have a small local airport about three miles away, but it is only for small planes. This loud jet sound was like it was hovering above the house, and then it quickly disappeared, not gradual. And finally, I received two new emails from Australia, both describing loud, invisible jet sounds, hollow thunder sounds, and UFO activity. On November 7th, 2019, a report came from the Southern Hemisphere from Melbourne, Victoria, Australia, in the suburb called Warrandyte. It is marked with the red Google pointer. Quote, 
There have been many times this year that both my wife and I have heard loud engine-like booms that have shaken our house and windows in the very ground outside. My wife and I would go out searching the skies, but there is absolutely nothing there at all each and every time. Considering how loud the engine noises have been, we expected to see an aircraft very low, but nothing whatsoever has been in our sky. Also, Both myself and my wife have witnessed aerial craft, both triangular and circular in shapes. And then there was another one earlier this year that was like the shape of a large cigar cylinder seen from the side. The cylinder was lit up in light like the sun that seemed to drop on our back garden, something like a huge sticky spider web that glowed and tingled on our skin. After a few minutes, the light just faded away to literally nothing there at all. Now, a note here. In the 1950s, some UFO eyewitnesses described white fibrous material falling from the sky linked to the presence of one or more UFOs. The University of Colorado in the late 1960s during the Condon report investigation, described what they called angel hair because it came from the sky down as, quote, fibrous material, which falls in large quantities, but is unstable and disintegrates and vanishes soon after falling, close quote. And this Australian writer reports the same thing, quote, it was the most strange experience ever and disturbing because it left absolutely no evidence of the strange cobweb-like material that fell to the ground. Where we live in Warrandyte, Australia, we are not near any airport and there are no rocket launching places here either. So what is going on? That's the question for all of us. And then all the way going west from Melbourne and Sydney across the huge continent of Australia. The next report is from Mount Lawley in Perth, Western Australia. Hello, Linda. First of all, I would like to say how much I thoroughly enjoy your Wednesday YouTube broadcasts. Although in Perth, Western Australia, I have to wait until I get home from work on Thursday night to watch them because of all those hours difference between where we are in the United States and Australia. After watching your Wednesday, November 6th show, I had to write you again. I live in a suburb of Perth, Western Australia called Mount Lolly, and I am used to planes flying over. As you would expect, the sound of an airliner comes on very gradually, is louder when it is overhead, and then it gradually disappears. It also comes from one place and then disappears in the opposite direction. That's what we're used to. However, every now and then, not regularly, but on multiple occasions, I have heard a loud roaring sound, like the engines of an airliner very close to my neighborhood's houses. It lasts only for a few seconds, perhaps 20 to 30 seconds. It starts suddenly and stops suddenly. It is not as loud as I have heard you and others describe but it's still quite loud and it has a consistent loudness and then is short-lived. I guess you could say it is like a burst of sound. So it looks like it truly is a worldwide phenomenon. Thank you and hugs to chocolate and fluffy clothes. Quote from down the Southern Hemisphere with people now from Slovenia to Australia to around the United States all reporting this same strange phenomenon. And my question to all of you out there who might be military or working in the government, and you may have information about all of this, is it possible that invisible UFOs are behind the loud jet-like sounds? Since World War II, human pilots have seen UFOs suddenly pop into view in the sky and then pop back out as if their visibility in Earth's skies, meaning the UFOs, can be turned on and off just like a light switch. Some researchers have wondered 
If the blinking in and out means that UFOs travel by moving in and out of other dimensions, and when they pop in the sky here on Earth, they are physically here, but when they blink out, has the craft literally popped into another dimension, maybe even jumping light years? Another hypothesis comes from experienced jet fighter pilots, radar operators, and Luis Elizondo, who directed the Pentagon's office called Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, also known as ATIP. And he, Lou, is now with Tom DeLong's To the Stars Academy, known as TTSA. Well, one characteristic common to UFOs is controlled invisibility, invisibility to visibility and back to not being able to be seen. Now, remember, Back on December 16th, 2017, that big headline in the front page of the New York Times, the Washington Post, and Politico about Navy fighter pilots astounded by the flight abilities of UFOs in front of them and unrecorded gun camera FLIR infrared doing maneuvers, speeds, mid-air stops, turns, and popping in and out of visibility. These are all abilities that human pilots do not do. Luis Elizondo says there are five extraordinary UFO capabilities, or what he calls observabil observables, that separate the UFO phenomenon from terrestrial aviation. The first is anti-gravity lift, going against gravity without any visible means of propulsion rising, turning into a lifting body suddenly. Then, second, instantaneous sudden acceleration. Radar operators on the Nimitz naval ship tracked a UFO going more than 30 times the speed of sound at sea level. Well, that's 770 miles an hour. Multiply that times 30. That would have a UFO traveling at 23,100 miles an hour. Third, hypersonic velocities without signatures. Now, what that means, UFOs are seen traveling much faster than the speed of sound, but they don't leave any vapor trails or sonic booms like human terrestrial aircraft do. Those are the signatures that UFOs do not leave behind. Fourth, transmedium travel. UFOs can move as easily in and out of Earth's waters as popping in and out of our planet's atmosphere. One Navy sonar operator in the Nimitz incident south of San Diego in November of 2004 timed a UFO moving in ocean water faster than 70 knots. That's roughly two times the speed of nuclear subs. UFOs have even been observed to enter rock walls and mountains as if the solid matter were not there. And a fifth extraordinary UFO ability listed by Lou Elizondo at TTSA is cloaking invisibility, low observability. And that's the invisibility technology that makes observing and tracking UFOs difficult for human pilot eyes, radar, or other means. And it is the one that might be involved with the ear-splitting, jet-like noise coming right above people in a clear sky, even shaking their house. And yet, human eyes can't see the perpetrator of the loud noise. If it is UFOs, why? Why such strange cat-and-mouse games with humans? Why loud, explosive booms, metallic scrapings, trumpets, or loud jet sounds. And UFO invisibility has been on the government's list to understand since World War II. One of the most important books about the U.S. government's efforts, early efforts to understand and back engineer retrieve UFOs, is The Day After Roswell, first released in 1997 on the 50th anniversary of the July 1947 
Roswell UFO crashes. There were clearly crashes before and a after. But what Colonel Corso addressed were the ones that were in that July 1947 that made headlines. Colonel Corso was a member of President Dwight Eisenhower's National Security Council. He, Eisenhower was president from 1953 to 1961, and Colonel Corso also was former head of the Foreign Technology Desk at the U.S. Army's Research and Development Office in the Pentagon, headed by General Arthur Trudeau, who was a good friend of President Eisenhower after World War II. Colonel Corso reported that the MJ-12 Working Group that had been appointed by uh, President Truman and was kept updated uh, by uh, General Eisenhower, who became president, and that the MJ-12 working group, he reported, Colonel Corso, was updated on, quote, every single alien spacecraft appearance that astronauts reported, especially during the early series of Apollo flights when the EBEN, and he spelled it all caps, that is an acronym for extraterrestrial biological entities that our government has been using for decades. And that when the Eben craft began buzzing the lunar modules on successive missions after they thrusted out of Earth orbit, and remember, this is Colonel Corso reporting in his book. He says, the United States Army and Air Force managed to find at least 122 photos taken by astronauts on the moon that showed some evidence of an alien presence. It was a startling find, and it was one of the many reasons that the Reagan administration pushed so hard for the Space Defense Initiative in 1981. That was what was known as SDI, and was headed by physicist Edward Teller, close quote. Now, Colonel Corso also talked to me face to face on July 7th of 1997 at the 50th anniversary of the July 1947 Roswell UFO crashes in a conference that was held in Roswell. There he told me when he worked in the Pentagon for General Trudeau, they knew that there was a non-human base inside of our moon inhabited by alien intelligences with very advanced technologies. And Colonel Corso described in his book on page 267, quote, it was the UFOs, the alien spacecraft, thinking themselves invulnerable and invisible in our skies as they soared around the edges of our atmosphere, swooping down at will to destroy our communications with EMP, electromagnetic pulses, buzz our spacecraft, colonize our lunar surface and interior, mutilate cattle in their own horrendous biological experiments, and even abduct human beings for their medical tests and hybridization of the species. And what was worse, we had to let them do it because we had no weapon to defend ourselves." Close quote. That's when Colonel Corso was working in our government through the Eisenhower to the Kennedy timeline. And maybe things were rough then. Maybe it's gotten better. Maybe we have these agreements that would make interstellar trade possible that Spartan 1 and Spartan 2 talked to me about in my documentary that we will be releasing on Video On Demand this month. And I hope to give you more information about that next week. But it has been always one of the schizophrenic aspects of the 40 years of investigation that I've done. 
you start with animal mutilations and it seems horrendous. That's what Colonel Corso said himself. And it leads to the human abduction syndrome or experiencers. And sometimes those seem to be positive. Some people have even been healed while others are terrified. That leads to government policies of denial when the government itself is out studying animal mutilations and human abductions and telling the world they don't exist when they do. And then you get to the whole huge challenge that Colonel Corso had firsthand knowledge about. Taking from crashes or deliberate placement in our hands through Trojan horse-like kind of presentations of craft, and we gather from various locations extraterrestrial technology to back engineer. That's what Colonel Corso did with General Trudeau in the Pentagon under orders of President Dwight D. Eisenhower. And then all of these corporations in the United States are trying to patent extraterrestrial technology, get it into our corporations to protect it from falling into the hands of our perceived international enemies or competitors, China, Russia, and others. And then you get to this current confusing time when it appears that we are trying to, both in the white world and the black world, try to back engineer extraterrestrial technology to get it into the white world and then finally maybe tell the truth. And that comes right to a news story that I posted early today on November 13th that I hope you will all go to and read and think about. And that is at www.earthfiles.com. Go to there after the live stream. But it ties into all of this because the title says it all. Huge mass of metal at moon's south pole, our moon's south pole. Is it a buried asteroid or an alien base? And when you read about it, think of Colonel Corso in his book, The Day After Roswell, saying, quote, the United States Army and Air Force managed to find at least 122 photos taken by astronauts on the moon that showed some evidence of an alien presence, close quote. Spartan 1, Spartan 2, another Navy SEAL, others that have served in the Navy in other capacities, Marine. I have had several people with proven DD-214s and military background say that they have either firsthand knowledge or they've had briefing knowledge that inside of our moon is an alien base that has been there probably for millions of years. And that when you see a headline about the discovery of a strange and mysterious, huge, gigantic, metallic mass at the south pole of our moon that's on the interior, deep, a couple of hundred miles at least, just remember, those might be legitimate mysteries to the scientists trying to understand what they find. And our government on the MJ-12 side, going back to the Truman and Eisenhower and Kennedy administrations, they might have known, yes, we have confirmed there is an extraterrestrial biological entity, Eben base, on the interior of our moon. And that means that whatever we are dealing with in the UFOs, UAPs, that might involve cat and mouse games with us humans, sounds in which we cannot see what the perpetrator of the sound is, or something that appears and we can see through it, 
that suggests that it is a hologram and that we're still being toyed with, played with, tested. And then there are the many experiencers in the human abduction syndrome for the decades, some of which say, I was healed. I know a scientist. He's convinced that gray Eben types healed his heart and that he's been able to live a, a life because he was headed possibly toward death at a young age. It's all mixed up. Mixed signals, invisibility when things are there, holograms that we can see through that aren't there but are projected. And this is why I hope that we all can continue to gather on Wednesday nights as often as possible so I can share with you some of my insights and hear from you in letters, in emails, and during the Q&A of our Wednesday nights. I love this. I love hearing from you. I love that you're all out there wanting to hear from me and to see what your fellow audience are asking and what they are reporting. And now, Peggy, let's go to that part of the show I love, which is what questions are on the minds of our audience on this night of November 13th, 2019? Hi, Linda. First tonight, I'd like to say some thank yous for some super chats we've had tonight. We have Exo Dasha, Dr. J, Vicki Martinez, Stephen, Rachel Daly Hug. Wow. Len Healer, Stephen, oh, sorry, Stephanie Monty, Mr. Catfish, and it's Stephen Ely again. Thank you, everyone. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. I, I really, I really appreciate it. Um, and I, I want to say to all of you who have sent me emails and letters uh, from your heart and your soul that from super chats to those thank yous it feels like we are building something here that is the agape love that i think is what humanity once upon a time that was the goal and maybe from here outward all of us could be trying to have that feeling that we are truly our brothers, our sisters, and that it's being together, it's the strength of being together that maybe we'll get to that headline and the governments will not be so worried that we're all going to collapse if we are told the truth, that we're not alone in this universe. So I know that all of you are standing strong waiting like I am, and we just need to expand those numbers, and I really appreciate everything from all of you. And Peggy, what have we got up for the first question? Priscilla asks a great question. She'd like to know what you think personally, what personal list you've made of what are the probable causes that this sound could have come from? At the top of my list, I think we are dealing with, uh, I'm going to use the word other intelligence because I don't know which type, and there's clearly a bunch of types, and those types make androids and cyborgs and clones to do work on this planet for them, so it's very hard to know what are you dealing with at any given time, but I think it is very consistent with what we have been learning since World War II. It is a phenomenon that pops in and out, it is a phenomenon <clears throat> that plays uh, like cat and mouse games with humans. Uh, many people over the years that I've been investigating where military people have said, you just get the impression that we're being played with like a cat and a mouse. Well, maybe the sounds and the strange sounds, like, because they really did have a kind of a beginning in 2011. And remember what we were all wondering was going to happen in December of 2012 because of the Mayan calendar. 
and we seem to sail through 2012 with uh, nothing that would fall into the category of apocalypse. However, now let me share with you a secret. I learned this from a scientist. It was never uh, publicized, uh, but according to a scientist, a geophysicist, he said that starting uh, around uh, three or four months into 2012, that the electromagnetic field of the planet started decreasing. And it went all the way down to December and they were really worried because if it goes to zero, depending upon how long the magnetic field would stay at zero, you've got cosmic rays and solar particles and everything and you start worrying about what's going to happen to the skin of earth life and uh, animals and marine life and everything. And they were worried, he said. But when they got to that kind of magic time that everybody was wondering, were the Mayans given some kind of um, insight into the timeline so that when we got into December of 2012, that something major was going to happen and could this reduction of the magnetic field down be that? And he said, suddenly when they got into January and February, they, don't know, they still don't understand what happened. It all started rising again. I tell you this in the context of what could be making the sounds what projects holograms, what could have had the ability to control the whole magnetic field slowly of the earth down and then back up. If we are dealing with the kind of huge intelligences that are so advanced as described for me by that DIA guy back in December of 1999, he said they have the ability to move a six mile diameter asteroid out of our matter timeline into another dimension or another timeline. And he was telling me that because our government doesn't understand why was that six mile diameter asteroid allowed to hit the Earth, take out 95% of the surface earth life 65, 66 million years ago that ended the dinosaurs and what came next? Mammals. It could be that the size and the scope of alien experimentation and harvesting of genetic material and the creation of new species in a laboratory like Earth that has two-thirds ocean and one-third land, that their timelines, their games with what they are doing on our planet are incomprehensible to us. One day will we be, ever be told the truth that starting in 2011, before 2012, that these strange sounds started because there was some kind of a testing, some kind of a manipulation. Will we ever be told publicly that magnetic field decline in 2012 was a real worry, but it never reached the public? But both of those and what we're talking about today, all related to concerns about advanced other intelligences manipulating our planet, manipulating DNA in already evolving primates to create Homo sapien, manipulating DNA in already evolving reptiles to create 85 million year experiment that we call the dinosaurs, that all of it would be different chapters in the lab book of extraterrestrials so advanced that they can move through perhaps not only just this, only this universe, but other universes, other timelines, other dimensions, 
and that the scope, the scope of what we are beginning to learn about and that hopefully we will be told the whole truth is that we humans are somebody else's genetic manipulation. And how will we on the Petri dish of the microscope ever fully understand the eye that is attached to an intelligence looking down on us through the microscope? Very frankly, it doesn't scare me at all. And I don't think it scares most of you. And that this is, the, this is part of the goal of what we are coming together is we need to be able to feel with each other as human beings that we have a strength and a reason for being alive that is not something that just has to fall down on the ground and disappear because there's other life in the universe. We've been sold that bill of goods as the reason why we haven't been told the truth. I don't accept it for a minute. So the sounds, my first guess, they are dealing with something of another intelligence that is testing something, but what and why. I sure hope that there are some people out there, military backgrounds, government backgrounds, in any country who might have information about some of this and could get in touch with me through FedEx or through mail or through Proton Mail and tell me what you know about why all of these strange sounds seeming to have a beginning in 2011. And here we are about to go into 2020. What is coming next and how long will it be? until we are finally given the respect of being told the truth that we're not alone in this universe. Peggy, what about another question? Somebody would like to know what your thoughts are about Freemasonry. Well, my grandfather on my mother's side uh, was a 33rd degree Mason. I know that the astronauts I know Buzz Aldrin, the astronaut in Apollo 11, he was a 33rd degree Mason. I know that Franklin Delano Roosevelt and President Truman and Cordell Hall, who was uh, Secretary of State uh, during the difficult uh, war years. Uh, George Marshall, who was our Secretary of War, they were all 33rd degree Masons. Through the last sort of going from the Magna Carta 1100s up, it seems like there have been layers of information, just like layers of information in MJ-12. Layers of policies, here's truth down here. And that truth, that solid truth that may or may not involve spiritual issues gets this laid over it. Once upon a time, it was called sigils. There may be some of you who know that word, S-I-G-I-L-S. -I -I sigils were how people survived a couple of thousand years ago when, if you proclaimed that you were a Christian and a follower of Christ, you might be stabbed by somebody. So sigils, Freemasonry, Rosicrucian, all of these lines coming up through history, each one may have originally come about and evolved like sigils to give language and groups the ability to be safely together in the public while they were sharing secret information. And the echo then to the world we're living in now, where 
none of the governments of the world, with whatever knowledge they have about non-human intelligences interacting with our planet and solar system for millennia, still choosing to keep that big truth away from us, we get layers of confusing and schizophrenic news because there still are so many policies of denial. And in some strange way, I think that that is why some of these evolutionary groups, at least for the last couple of thousand years, I think that's why they developed and evolved for self-protection and having cover. What about another question? And do you believe that the Anunnaki are still manipulating us? That is a really good question. There are two immediate answers. One, there are a lot of academics who would say the Anunnaki are mythological. I don't think that's true at all. I've talked with too many people on this side that would be people in military or have had government service and they would say that the Anunnaki were the manipulators of DNA on this planet to create the first standing of primates. But then you get to another very interesting question that came up with Spartan One in my documentary about Antarctica. He said he had been told that those that were involved with the creation of the Anunnaki, so again, layers, if the Anunnaki are ETs from someplace else in the Milky Way and they come to Earth and they have gold that they want and molybdenum that they want and all of these various metals, because that's what I understand, doesn't matter where you come from in the universe, you still need certain uh, elements to work with. And so the Anunnaki, maybe they went to Mars first uh, and whatever happened on Mars, whether there was a war, it, there's all kinds of hypotheses, but let's say that the Anunnaki went to Mars and something bad happened. And then they come to Earth and they want to uh, explore, harvest, and genetically manipulate this planet, and they start trying to work and genetically manipulate life on Earth for what they are interested in, what their experiments are, and they end up uh, being the progenitors of the first Homo erectus that keeps evolving to us. Spartan One raised the question that there are progenitors of the Anunnaki out in the universe, progenitors, that which comes before, and that they are considered to be hostile. That he was told that however far back this goes out in the Milky Way galaxy or even to another galaxy, that whoever the humanoids are, and remember Spartan One said that he was shown photos and that they had larger, slightly larger heads than humans, but no hair, uh, definitely not grays, uh, very, uh, very well-proportioned uh, humanoids. If they are a echo, a residue of progenitors someplace else, it may be that in this universe and other universes, that there is some, we'll call it primal, first, humanoid shape, and that out of that, we'll call it bloodline throughout however far it goes, there would be a humanoid type. And then you could argue the same thing for reptilian humanoids, insectoids, and all of the different types. Uh, the Ebens may or may not be some very sophisticated artificial intelligence. There's arguments made both ways. The praying mantises come up uh, in the abduction experience or liter literature over and over again by so many people 
with the most fascinating perception that you hear over and over from people who have encountered the tall praying mantises. These are the two things that are usually said. They are as ancient as the age of our solar system. And that's 4.6 billion years old. And the mind reels if there was any truth that something could be made to live and oversee seeding of solar systems in new solar systems and could be 4.6 billion years old. Doesn't compute to us with our rapid turnaround less than a century lives. The other thing that comes across, it is very, very palpable when you're in the presence of experiencers who have felt this and they say this. As I'm standing in front of the praying mantis, I begin to feel great sadness. And the great sadness seems to be for me, as if the praying mantis knows something about all of us humans that we don't know. I've asked many different people who have had encounters with the praying mantis and they have felt that sadness. Can you penetrate? Do you know what is that sadness about? What would make a creature that allegedly was produced to oversee solar system seeding, what would they know that would make them feel sad for us? Now, a lot of people Government types that I have had d these exact discussions with is, Linda, you can't tell the public. And my argument is, you owe the public everything that the power brokers and the governments know. If there are ingredients in the future that are going to come down, say, through climate change, and that we're going to lose the city of Venice in Italy, let's say, 70% right now underwater. It's one of the most beautiful places that I have ever been. Venice is like something magical, that, that humans were able to create a city for artists, with artists, by artists, tremendous spiritual weavings in the city of Venice. And the first time I was there was probably 30, 35 years ago. That's before so much water. And the reason I'm bringing it up, it was made by humans. The art, the splendor, the ability to create glass, in forms that are just spectacular. The whole interstitial feeling of Venice was, this is where humans, we are a great species. We deserve to survive. We deserve to know what it is like to love each other in an agape love and not always be fighting in wars and killing each other. What causes those distortions? And today, in a funny, strange way, I think of Venice, Italy now, 70% underwater, this glorious, beautiful place made by humans. And it is global warming that may be part a natural cycle, but certainly it has a lot to do with industrial and auto emissions putting out CO2 and methane blankets around our planet. And for those who argue that that isn't true, I think you haven't, you haven't interviewed as many scientists as I have since 1978 with the first interview that I did with um, Professor McElroy at Harvard University. And that's when he was beginning for the first time to create a, a computer model trying to feed in what they were already asking questions about in the end of the 70s. What 
is civilization and all of the emissions going to do to the future of our planet? And I remember being in his office at Harvard and him telling me that in 50 years, and that was 1977 or 78, in 50 years, which would be this coming decade, if what they were learning then came true. I think he told me then, half of Florida will be underwater. Look at the maps and the projections. We are this fantastic species with souls. We can create Venices and then we can create pollution and not be educated about it, not understand it, and end up destroying the glory that we have made. And it may be that whatever is going to happen in the next year, I hope, about governments and power brokers finally taking their chokehold away from the human family's necks and telling us the truth, the good, the bad, the ugly, and all in between. The part of what would happen is that humans might begin to look at ourselves that we need to learn from each other, listen to each other, and that governments, when they are at their best, are human beings trying to do the right thing for all other humans. That's what good government should be about. And we can only do that if we are being told truth, not political motivation, for this lie to cover this lie, to cover this corruption, and on and on. That we are actually would live on the planet with governments that would be telling the truth because the humans making up those governments would be you and me and all we would want would be to do the best, the most fair for our fellow human being. In that context, being told in a huge headline that is accepted around the world that we're not alone in this universe and we never have been and that all kinds of intelligences have interacted with this planet, the moon, Mars, our solar system, the Milky Way galaxy and beyond. That it isn't a worry about a shock to the system. That if we are told the truth and given evidence, all of the evidence, then you and I and all of us, we might begin with real truth to understand that whatever we are to what made us, that humans with knowledge have a right to stand on our two feet in front of other intelligences and not look at them as gods and not do their bidding, but look at them eye to eye and say, I am a fellow intelligence in this universe. That's my prayer. That's what I wrote about in An Alien Harvest and Glimpses of Other Realities, Volume 1 and Glimpses of Other Realities, Volume 2 and mysterious lights and crop circles. Everything in those four books are all of the interstitial pieces that we need to bring together and present on this planet as these are the pieces of this huge truth that is the opposite of what we have been taught and that there's nothing to be afraid of if truth and facts become what Earth begins to deal with for all humans. And as we go into Thanksgiving in the United States and the Christmas holiday season and Hanukkah and all of the other I'm going to call them 
relationships with a divine field. That all of the relationships with a divine field, whatever is true to you, we don't need to war about. And that they might be enhanced if we knew we're not alone in this universe. And that life forms make other life forms. But that the biggest whole of everything, whether there's an infinite number of universes and an infinite number of suns and an infinite number of planets and an infinite number of life forms, it all comes back to a divine field and the relationship of the divine field through souls, life force, into matter. And I think that is exciting, and I think we should know all of it, and that the black part of the yin and yang, if we are educated enough, then we get stronger, we don't get weaker. And that is my prayer for you in these holiday seasons and that next week I'll be back with something else. God only knows literally what will be breaking and that I love hearing from you. And next week uh, we will go another chapter with whatever is news and your questions I love. Thank you.